Resident Evil 3 is a survival horror game that originally battled with Code Veronica for the title of the third game in the series. In fact, Resident Evil 3 was originally meant to be a spin-off. This was changed due to the long wait between Resident Evil 2 and what would have been the third game, Code Veronica. Capcom were concerned by this and as a result ordered a game to be made. This game was originally titled Resident Evil 1.9. Resident Evil 1.9 would eventually go on to be titled Resident Evil Nemesis and Biohazard Last Escape. Eventually, after discussions, it was decided that 3 would be added to these titles and so Resident Evil 3 Nemesis became a mainline entry. The game is loved by fans and is considered one of the best in the series. Not only is it one of the best survival horror games of all time, it contains one of the greatest ever monsters, Nemesis. Upon its release on September the 22nd, 1999, Resident Evil 3 received universal acclaim from critics and by early October, the stores had sold over a million copies. It became a bestseller in a number of countries, including North America and the UK and by 2008, 3 million copies of the PlayStation version alone had been sold. The game was praised for its graphics, use of horror, inclusion of Nemesis and its replayability. However, it did receive criticism for its short length when compared to Resident Evil 2. The game was nominated for a number of awards including Adventure Game of the Year. Resident Evil 3 is seen by many as one of the best survival horror games of all time, boasting one of the most horrifying monsters in video game history. Now let's attempt to escape from the world of survival horror. Resident Evil. It all began as an ordinary day in September. An ordinary day in Raccoon City. A city controlled by Umbrella. No one dared to oppose them and that lack of strength would ultimately lead to their destruction. I suppose they had to suffer the consequences of their actions, but there would be no forgiveness. If only they had had the courage to fight. It's true that once the wheels of justice begin to turn, nothing can stop them. Nothing. It was Raccoon City's last chance, and my last chance, my last escape. The story begins in the dead of night. Raccoon City is under attack by hordes of the undead. Police have been deployed to stop the dead from advancing. Umbrella's biohazard countermeasure service have also been called into the city to help evacuate any Umbrella staff and civilians. This is Chopper Delta, preparing to drop off at area E95070. Despite all their firepower, they don't stand a chance. Both the police and Umbrella security personnel are overran. We then cut to Jill, 
a veteran when it comes to dealing with the undead at this point, who is looking to escape from the city. Jill begins making her way through the streets of Raccoon City, which by this point are completely overrun. As she works her way through the streets, she is surrounded by a horde. Jill holds up in a warehouse with a man named Dario. She informs him that the two of them must leave, but he refuses to listen to her, choosing instead to lock himself in a room. I just lost my daughter out there! How dare you tell me to go back outside! I'm sorry about your daughter, but there isn't going to be any rescue. We have to get out of here. No! I'm not going anywhere. I'd rather starve to death in here than be eaten by one of those undead monsters. Now leave me alone! Jill doesn't stick around for long and immediately makes her way out of the warehouse. Very quickly into her escape attempt, she runs into Brad, the pilot from Stars who rescued her from the facility in the Arclay Mountains. Brad is doing his best to fight his way through the large numbers of zombies. Jill chases after him and after fighting her way through the undead, she finds a shotgun. Eventually, Jill is able to make it to the bar where she once again sees Brad. <sighs> <sighs> Brad, hang in there. Why isn't someone doing something about this? I didn't know you were still alive, Jill. The police aren't trained for this kind of situation. What could they do? Listen, he's coming for us. We're both gonna die. What are you saying? You'll see. He's after Star's members. There's no escape. With that, he runs away and Jill is left to make her own way through the city. She decides to make her way towards the police station. In the bar, she picks up a lighter that she uses on a roped off door. It is through this door that she is attacked by the very thing that attacked her in the Arclay Mountains, Cerberus. She fights her way through them and eventually makes it to the RPD. It is here that Jill once again runs into Brad. Unfortunately for both of them, Nemesis is not far behind. <gasps> Jill! Brad! We've got a... With Brad dead, Jill has two choices to make. She can fight the monster or run into the police station. Jill decides to fight it and after a tricky battle, Nemesis is defeated. Jill picks up Brad's keycard and some items off the Nemesis and proceeds to make her way into the station. Jill makes her way to the desk in the main hall, where she collects a map of the RPD. She also uses Brad's ID to obtain a code. With that, Jill makes her way into the door on the left. In there, she finds Marvin, the cop Claire will interact with later on throughout the night. Jill makes her way through the room and out into the evidence room. In there, she finds two items, a crystal that will come in handy later on, and the star's key. With these new items, Jill fights her way to the star's office. In this room, she finds a number of key items. The first is a rocket launcher that she knows will be useful in her fight to escape. Jill also finds a fax by Robert Kendo, the man who Claire will run into later on throughout the night. The fax discusses a new weapon. The last item Jill finds is a lockpick that Jill will find most useful. After all, she is a master of unlocking. With these new items, Jill continues on, but before she can leave, a transmission comes through. Jill has everything she needs and begins making her way out of the RPD. Things would not go smoothly, however, as she runs into Nemesis once again. This time, he has a rocket launcher. The nemesis is in pursuit and Jill makes sure to evade each shot he takes at her. Eventually, she is able to leave the RPD and she uses her lockpick to unlock the door that will take her downtown. 
Upon arriving in downtown, Jill encounters a number of Cerberus. After she shoots her way through them, she is able to find a power cable. This may come in handy later on. The Cerberus are not the only monsters roaming the streets however, as Jill is confronted with a new monster, a Drain Demo. Despite its quick movement, Jill is able to kill it and with that she continues onwards. On the one side of this room there is an elevator, but it cannot be used yet as it needs a battery. Instead, Jill makes her way through to the other side of the room and through the only other door. She continues onwards, killing a number of zombies on the way and eventually makes it to a restaurant. It is here that she meets the man who spoke over the radio. What's that? Calm down, lady. I'm no zombie. My name's Carlos, Corporal of Umbrella's Biohazard Countermeasure Force. What's your name? Jill, did you just say you belong to Umbrella's army? Yeah, we came all the way out here to save you civilians, but the mission went bad the minute we landed. During this conversation, the nemesis returns and Jill once again has two options. She can run into the basement or run into the dining room. Jill chooses the latter. As the two leave the kitchen, Jill throws a lighted candle into the room, causing an explosion as it mixes with the leaking gases. The nemesis falls down but he is not dead. Within seconds he stands back up and the two of them do their best to fight him. Eventually the nemesis collapses and Jill is able to pick up the second part of her new weapon. With that, Jill and Carlos leave the restaurant and it is here that they finally converse. Tell me, why did Umbrella send your team in? We're here to rescue the civilians. Don't lie to me. Umbrella is the reason why this whole mess began. Look, we're just mercenaries, hired hands. Do you really think the master would tell his dogs why they have to retrieve the stick he just threw? If you want answers, you should talk to someone else. I am not with Umbrella. Jill continues onwards and eventually makes it to the Raccoon City newspaper office. After exploring for some time, she is eventually able to find another crystal. In the same room, she also finds an entry written by a journalist. Chaos and fear that you get from reading this entry really helps add to the tension. With this, Jill leaves the building and goes towards the entrance of the city hall. She uses the two crystals she picks up earlier to open the gates. Jill enters and eventually makes it to a tram. She goes on board and it is here that she meets other members of Umbrella's Biohazard Countermeasure Service. One of the survivors from the rescue team, right? I just ran into your teammate, Carlos. How did a girl like you manage to survive? Hey, I'm no ordinary civvy. I'm a member of STARS. STARS? You mean the RPD's special force team? Is someone wounded back there? Oh, this looks bad. Uh, they're coming. Get ready. Uh, uh, fire. Fire. Stay together. Calm down. You're safe now. Everything is going to be OK. So Jill, did you decide to help us out? It looks like we're the only ones who survived. We should work together. No, we can't trust her. Why? But Sergeant, we need her help. Our unit's down to you, me, and Lieutenant Mikhail. That's it. And Mikhail's hurt bad. If we don't cooperate, we won't be walking away from this mission. Then let's go over our plan. We're moving to the clock tower area, which is the designated landing zone for the extraction chopper. Once we get there and give the signal, the chopper will fly in and pull us out. That's a lot of ground to cover. I, I don't think we can make it on foot. 
The main problem we have is that the landing zone is cut off from here by the fire. So we have no choice but to use this cable car to navigate through it. Fortunately, we can also use it as a moving shield to get us through the worst areas. That works for me. Good plan, sir. Okay, people, let's get moving. Jill has learned that the clock tower is the designated area for evacuation. They decide that they are going to get there by using the tram. The issue is that the tram is not operational, so the first objective is to find a way to get it working again. In order to do this, Jill needs to find a fuse, a power cable and mixed oil. With this objective, Jill makes her way out of the tram in the hope of exploring more of City Hall. On the way, Jill is attacked by a group of zombies who break through a previously barricaded door. Once she deals with them, she makes her way through this newly available area, where she finds a statue of the Raccoon City Mayor. Jill takes a bronze book from it, as it may be useful later. She then makes her way towards the petrol station, where she uses a rusty crank and the wrench she found earlier to open up the shutter door. Once opened, Jill makes her way inside, where she once again bumps into Carlos. Jill! Hey, the zombies are getting restless. I know. I can hear them. What's going on? With that ominous note, Jill continues to explore the area, hoping to find some of the items she needs to fix the tram. While exploring, a zombie horde approaches and Carlos leaves in order to play hero. Jill! What's wrong? They're coming! They must have sniffed us out. They know we're here. Hey, calm down. Any objections to my playing hero this time? What are you doing? Carlos! With Carlos gone and the place being attacked by zombies, Jill knows she must continue onwards. It is in this area that Jill solves a puzzle that reveals some machine oil, an important item that she could potentially use to get the tram working. Just as Jill goes to explore more of the area, a spark causes a fire and Jill is forced to leave the building. Outside, Jill finds Carlos sitting against a wall. Luckily, he is not dead. He has managed to fend off the horde and the two continue together. However, it is at this moment that the fire spreads further. Jill is just about able to escape from the blast. Carlos and Jill go their separate ways, hoping that they can get out of this place quicker if they split up. Jill begins to make her way back towards City Hall. On the way back to City Hall, Jill uses the bronze book she took from the mayor's statue and uses it to gain a compass. She continues to make her way back to the statue she had come across earlier. Once there, she places the compass on the statue, and in return she is able to obtain the battery. This will allow her to use the lift she found earlier. The lift takes Jill down to a power plant. After killing a number of zombies, Jill eventually makes it to the main building of the power plant. Here she uses the machines in order to get the power in the facility up and running. She is able to open up two previously locked doors. In the first door is a fuse, one of the items Jill has been looking for. As she makes her way out of the room, a zombie horde attacks, and Jill has two options. She can turn the power up, which would cause an electrical overload, or she can escape. Jill chooses to fry them. Now that they have been dealt with, Jill continues to explore the building. In the other newly unlocked room, there is a Magnum Revolver, a weapon that will help her deal with the monsters around the city. With these new items, Jill begins making her way back towards the elevator. Once she uses the elevator, Jill makes her way back uptown in order to collect a fire hose that will help her unlock a new area. Once she obtains the hose, she uses it to put out a fire and with that, she continues onwards into the new area. In this new area is the Umbrella Office. Jill enters to begin exploring the building. It is here that she runs into Nikolai. What did you do? I had no choice. He was about to turn into a zombie. It would have been a threat, so I eliminated it. But he was still conscious, wasn't he? He was as good as dead. 
and it took fewer bullets to kill him now than it would have if he had transformed. Jill is beginning to grow suspicious of Nikolai. He may be telling the truth, but the coldness he shows towards shooting one of his comrades makes her believe otherwise. Jill leads him to get on with his business and begins to explore the Umbrella office. In the room is a computer that needs to be unlocked with a password. Jill is able to find this by watching an Umbrella advert that reveals the secret code. She uses this code to unlock the computer. This allows her to unlock an electronically locked door. Through this door, Jill finds an oil additive. She mixes this with the machine oil to create mixed oil, one of the items she needs to fix the tram. With this, she makes her way out of the Umbrella office. As she does, however, a zombie horde attacks. Jill fights her way through the now overrun building and heads back towards the tram. On her way back, however, Jill runs into her old friend, Nemesis. The two of them fight once again. Jill is able to defeat Nemesis and with him gone, she continues to make her way back to the tram. On her way back in the car park area, the floor begins to crumble. Clinging onto the edge, she notices that some barrels are beginning to roll towards her. Jill has two options here. She can jump down or she can attempt to get up without being hit by the barrels. Jill decides to choose the former. She is quick enough to dodge them and with this small inconvenience out of the way, she continues towards the tram. The horror has only just begun however, as she once again runs into Nemesis while making her way through the city hall grounds. Stars. He just refuses to stay dead. After dealing with him, Jill continues onwards, but her luck is not about to improve. She falls through a sinkhole, and it is here that she meets the Grave Digger. Jill knows that she must get out of here. She manages to find a ladder in the hole, but it needs power in order for her to be able to use it. She knows she must find a way to turn the power back on. It is at this moment that Jill notices a number of switches in the underground area. She begins using them and after some time the power is restored. Quickly Jill runs towards the ladder and climbs up it, managing to escape the grave digger for now. At last Jill is able to get back to the tram. She uses the power cable, fuse and mixed oil to get the tram running. It is at this moment that she meets up with Carlos once again. It looks like we're ready to go. Okay. Uh, Nikolai won't be joining us. I understand. I'll operate the cable car. Let's go. With that brief interaction, the two of them activate the tram and begin making their way towards the clock tower. Not long into their journey, however, something goes wrong. Mikhail! Jill goes to investigate, and when she does, she discovers that the nemesis has climbed on board. Mikhail! Jill! Get out of the cable car, now! Mikhail, wait, don't! Get out of here! Hurry! Mikhail's brave sacrifice gives Jill and Carlos some time to plan an escape. It is at this time that Carlos informs Jill that the brakes are not working. Jill has two options, jump out of the window or use the emergency brake. Jill decides to choose the latter. Despite using the emergency brakes, the tram still crashes and Jill wakes up alone.
Jill continues onwards towards the clock tower. Once there, she meets up with Carlos once again, who is in a state of hysteria. Carlos, I don't believe it. You're alive. I'm not sure how we're gonna get out of this town. What are you talking about? We made it! You don't get it. They have no intention of letting us make it back alive. Do you really think we can trust their great evacuation plan? Huh, it's just a piece of paper. But we don't have any other choice than to trust them right now. No, if we're gonna die, then we should get to choose when it happens. Uh. So that's it then, huh? You're giving up? No. I just... I can't handle it. With Carlos once again running away, Jill is left to find a way to escape by herself. During Jill's exploration of the building, she's able to find a new weapon, the Mine Thrower. Another weapon that she knows will come in handy. She also reads through a document that instructs Umbrella's operators to strike the bell in order to call for evac. After exploring some more, she is able to find the clock tower key. She uses that to activate a ladder that leads to the machinery room. Along the way to this room, she has to deal with an old enemy, spiders, that by now she is used to killing. Jill makes her way up the ladder and it is in this machine room that Jill collects the silver gear. She then solves a musical bass puzzle. After doing this, she is able to obtain the Kronos chain. She combines this with the clock tower key to create the Kronos key. She begins making her way back down to the locked green door she found earlier on. On her way back down, Jill is once again attacked by the nemesis, and once again she has two options. She can use the light or cord to deal with him. Now that he has been dealt with again, Jill makes her way back down to the locked green door. Once she's through this door, Jill fights her way through some more spiders. At the end of the hall is a new room. Within this room are three crystals and some paintings. Jill puts the crystals in a certain order and is able to obtain a gold cog. Jill combines the two cogs together to create the Kronos cog. With that, she begins making her way back to the clock tower in order to activate the bell. Once this is done, the bell begins to ring and Jill makes her way to the landing site. Things, however, would not go to plan. We're saved. Down here! It's finally over. Jill is now infected with the virus, but this doesn't stop her from fighting Nemesis. After a long and difficult battle, Jill is able to defeat him. She is too weak to continue however, and she collapses onto the ground. Carlos wakes up and carries her into the chapel of the clock tower. He knows he must find a way to stop the virus. October 1st, night. 
I woke up to the sound of falling rain. I can't believe I'm still alive. Carlos? It looks like our roles have been reversed from when we originally met, huh? Don't worry, Jill. This chapel is safe. I've been infected by the virus, haven't I? Hey! Take it easy. I'm okay. Don't feel any pain. But that's what bothers me. If I can't feel anything, then what does that mean? Don't give up, Jill. I'll take care of you. Whatever you do, don't let that virus beat you. With this, Carlos leaves Jill and begins making his way towards the exit of the clock tower. After fighting his way through some zombies, he successfully leaves the building and begins making his way towards the hospital. It is here that Carlos begins his search for a cure. Almost immediately into this search, Carlos is attacked by the formidable hunters. He manages to fight both of them off and continues to make his way through the hospital. In the next room, he finds the director's notes that detail the symptoms and process of infection an individual goes through. Carlos also finds a tape recorder that he can use to open the locked door that requires voice recognition. Carlos uses the voice recorder and the door opens to reveal a lift. He gets inside and makes his way to 4F. Once he reaches this floor, he begins to search these rooms. In the first room he searches, he finds a dead doctor, who is carrying a code of some kind. Carlos makes a note of this and continues onwards. Eventually, after searching the floor, Carlos runs into Nikolai. Don't shoot! No! Nikolai? You're still alive? You saw what happened? What's going on? I'm one of the supervisors. That's all you need to know. Wait! Carlos now knows that Nikolai is not on their side. There is nothing he can do about that right now, and so instead he decides to explore this new room. He finds a key to room 402. With this new item, he begins to search for this locked room. He eventually finds it, and upon entering it, there is a suspicious cart in the middle of the room. Carlos pushes the cart into a particular corner, and this reveals a safe. He uses the numbers he got from the dead doctor to open it. Within the safe is the vaccine base. Carlos is one step closer to helping Jill. Having explored the whole of this floor, Carlos makes his way back to the elevator and heads down towards B3. Once arriving there, he is attacked by a horde, but makes quick work of them with his assault rifle. While continuing onwards, Carlos is attacked by more hunters. He dispatches them and makes his way into a lab, where he finds out where the hunters have come from. Carlos grabs the medium base and turns the power back on. He then uses the synthesizers to create the vaccine medium. Once this is done, he mixes the base and medium vaccines together to create the vaccine. Carlos has what he needs. He just needs to get back to Jill, but the hunters will not make it easy for him. After fighting through a number of hunters, Carlos is able to make it to the entrance of the hospital. It turns out that he did this at the right time, as someone has placed a bomb on the wall of the hospital entrance. Carlos runs to get out before it goes off. Come on. That was close, but he manages to escape just in time. He begins making his way back to Jill, however Nemesis is there to stop that from happening. Carlos fights the nemesis, but for the most part he ignores him. 
His objective is to kill Jill. Due to Nemesis being obsessed with Jill, Carlos is able to defeat him. Now that Nemesis has been dealt with, he makes his way into the chapel in order to give Jill the vaccine. We barely made it. How do you feel? I'm okay. What happened to you? I just fought with that monster. Uh, I've got some bad news. Nikolai's still alive. But I thought he was dead. <laughs> that guy doesn't know the meaning of the word dead. What is he after? I don't know. All I know is that he is our enemy. I'm sorry, Jill, but there's something I gotta take care of. I promise I'll meet up with you later. But don't worry. With Jill back on her feet, she begins to head towards the exit of the clock tower, in the hope of finding a new way out of the city. Upon leaving the chapel, Jill is attacked by the nemesis. Jill manages to defeat him rather quickly thanks to the damage Carlos did to him before. After leaving the clock tower, Jill uses her lockpick to unlock a new room. In this room is the park key. She leaves the room and makes her way towards the park entrance. Upon entering the park, Jill begins to explore, but is attacked by a number of monsters along the way. This includes some worms and hunters, who Jill has had plenty of experience dealing with in the past. Eventually, Jill is able to find two items. The first is the cemetery key. The second is a letter that seems to imply that Umbrella used this outbreak to test the combat data of the UBCS. It seems that Umbrella had no real intention of helping anyone escape from the city. Instead, it was all one big testing ground. Jill has reached as far as she can go right now. She makes her way back to the main park area and through the other door. In this area is a fountain. Jill uses the controls to drain the water and with that she continues onwards. She eventually makes it to the cemetery. As she makes her way through this area, the dead begin to rise from their graves. Jill does her best to avoid the rising dead and eventually uses the key to enter a cabin. In this cabin, Jill picks up a metal pipe and uses this to open up a secret room behind the fireplace. In this secret room, Jill finds a number of items. The first is a document that contains information on Umbrella's observations of the virus. It even mentions that there may be a giant alligator in the sewers. This is the same one that Claire at this point has already dealt with. The document then goes on to talk about Nemesis and its mission to eliminate all STARS members. The second is a fax that reports that the US government are going to obliterate the city in the morning. The final item is the park key. This will unlock the chain door Jill found earlier. As Jill leaves, a message comes through over the radio. All supervisors, mission terminated. Return immediately. Repeat. All supervisors return immediately. Over. With this new information, Jill leaves the secret room, and it is here that she runs into Nikolai. I'm quite impressed you've managed to stay alive up until now. And you seem to be doing a pretty good job of looking out for yourself. How about helping out? I have no intention of helping you. Because we're nothing but pawns in all this? In a manner of speaking, you are. Our employers wanted a detailed analysis of the zombie beings which were created through infection by the T-Virus. You're saying that they deliberately sent in a military unit to be butchered by their creations? Not exactly. Although the conditions encountered on this operation were extreme, it was an unexpected outcome that the team would be wiped out. We were only required to collect live data from the subjects. Ah! Another mutant! After that brief interaction, Jill now knows that Umbrella are even more heartless than she thought, although this is no real shock for her. There also seems to be a monster nearby. Jill goes outside to investigate. Back in the cemetery, Jill is attacked, but this time, it is not Nemesis. What's going on? Whoa! <gasps> The Gravedigger has finally trapped Jill in a ditch. She knows she must fight in order to escape. After a lengthy battle, Jill is able to defeat it once and for all. 
At last, one of the monsters is finally gone. Jill makes her way towards the locked gate. On her way, she fights off a number of zombies that the park is now overran by. Jill eventually makes it to the chain door and uses the key. Once she reaches the other side, Jill crosses a bridge, but it is here that she is once again attacked by Nemesis. Jill has two options, jump off or push him off. Jill has once again dealt with Nemesis and begins making her way through the factory. Very early on into her search, Jill runs into Carlos. Carlos. Jill. Listen very carefully. They're planning on launching a missile directly into the city as soon as day breaks. The explosion will be powerful enough to destroy everything. Are you sure about that? Positive. I heard it straight from a supervisor. They'll go this far to cover their tracks. Come on, we have to hurry. There isn't much time left. Carlos is now ready to fight to survive and Jill begins making her way around the factory in order to find a way out. Very soon into this search, Jill solves a steam-based puzzle that opens up a door on the upper levels of the factory. Jill continues deeper into the factory where she is attacked by zombies. Eventually, Jill finds a document where she learns that the factory is just a cover for another facility. Jill must find a way to get out of here. She realises that in order to do this, she must use the water purification machine to get the power back on. After solving the puzzle, she is able to do this. With a new door unlocked, Jill makes her way over to it. After entering this room, she is attacked by Nikolai. You're still wandering around. Nikolai? So, you want to get out of here alone? Is that your plan? I made certain none of the other supervisors survived. Since I'll be the only one who knows what really happened, I'll have more bargaining power when it comes to discussing my bonus. Then why kill me? I'm not on their payroll. They want you eliminated for reasons of their own. The amount is modest, but there is a reward to be claimed upon the confirmation of your death. That's great, except I have no intention of contributing to your retirement fund. Nikolai has been killed and Jill has an idea of who might have done it. Jill continues through the next door. All of a sudden, an alarm goes off and the doors lock behind her. To make matters worse, she is not alone. Warning. Proceeding with operation in treatment room. Please evacuate immediately. Jill fights for her life. Not only does she have to deal with Nemesis, she also needs to find a way out of the room before the countdown gets to zero. Jill shoots at the acid pipes in order to injure Nemesis. During the fight, his arms and head fall off, but he is still committed to destroying all Star's members. Eventually, it is too much for him and Nemesis collapses. Jill manages to find a keycard among the dead bodies, and with that, she exits the room. After leaving, an emergency broadcast starts, informing everyone in the building that the missile is being launched. Confirmed. 
Jill knows she must hurry. She uses the keycard to open up a new area. As she continues through, Carlos gets in touch. Jill! Jill, where are you? If you can hear this transmission, respond immediately! I'm here. What's up? I got us a ride. The chopper engines are running and ready to go. On my way. The city's about to become ground zero. Hurry up! And don't forget to take that device with you. What does it do? That device tracks the distance of the approaching missile. Make sure you bring it with you. Now listen to me. Don't give up. We're both gonna survive this. Just get over here! Jill continues on and eventually reaches a large space. In here she finds the body of a tyrant. She also finds a door that she cannot get through as the power needs to be restored. Jill finds three batteries that she needs to push into place. As this happens, a transformed nemesis appears. This doesn't deter Jill and she continues to get the power back online. Eventually she does it. This seems to activate a weapon known as the railgun. Jill uses this to shoot at Nemesis and after a couple of shots the railgun destroys him. At the same time the door unlocks and Jill is able to continue. However as she is about to leave, Jill is attacked by Nemesis once again, although by this point there is not much left of him. Jill has a choice, execute him or just leave him. Jill chooses the former. With that, Jill is finally free of the nemesis that has been hunting her the whole night. Relieved and exhausted, she makes her way out of the building and takes a lift to the helicopter landing site. It is here that she meets Carlos and the two of them escape Raccoon City together. At last, their nightmare is finally over. I guess we're all set. Alright then, we're out of here. Oh no! It's here! It's time to go! President and the Federal Council have passed judgment over the civilians of Raccoon City. The President and Federal Council have ruled that the Bacalus Terminate operation is the best course of action for this extreme situation and have since executed. Based on that fact, Raccoon City has been literally wiped off the map. Current reports have the death toll surpassing the 100,000 mark. Our hearts go out to those poor civilians.
Resident Evil 3 uses fixed camera angles just as the previous games did, in order to create suspense and horror. Capcom uses camera angles that are often exploited in movies and with this they can create different atmospheres in certain locations. In this game especially, the camera angles are exploited very well. For example, when you are moving through the streets, you can hear zombies but you cannot see them. You continue onwards and all of a sudden there are six of them. They are now moving towards you at a quick pace and you have no choice but to run back. Capcom does this a lot throughout the game. Just as before, it is a smart way of building suspense and horror, and Capcom by this point has been able to perfect it by building off the last two games. Resident Evil 3's controls are improved since Resident Evil 2. The first big change is that analog controls are now available, making it easier for most players to maneuver their way throughout the game. Players are still able to use the direction buttons if this feels more comfortable for them. Players are also able to choose between using R1 or R2 to aim the weapon. The biggest change however comes with the dodging mechanic. If you press the aim button just before you are attacked, you can dodge oncoming attacks. This is a very important gaming mechanic especially when fighting Nemesis. It is a great addition although at times the response is not great. Another revolutionary idea comes from the chance for players to make choices. These choices will affect how the game ends. This really helps add something unique to Resident Evil 3 and when I first played this I thought it was the greatest thing ever, as it was not a common occurrence in the games that I had played before. These choices make this game one that is worth replaying, just to see how things could go. Ammo mixing is also something new and is definitely something that gives the player more freedom when it comes to what ammo they would like to have more of. This is a feature that we will see perfected in future Resident Evil titles and one that I thoroughly enjoyed as it allowed you to strategize more. The last area to discuss in this chapter is of course safe rooms. Just as before the music in safe rooms is still the greatest feeling ever, especially in this game when I am almost dead due to fighting Nemesis. The relief I get when entering these rooms is too much to explain, you just have to experience it for yourself. It really is a testament to how well Capcom is able to use suspense and horror. You are in such a tense mood that just hearing some music can offer you so much relief. The saving mechanics are also the same as previous games. You can only save at certain points, so you have to be very careful about when you decide to do it, as you only have a certain number of ink ribbons. I feel like this is amplified more in this game because you could face Nemesis at any point. The saving mechanics in this game really help you realise how important staying alive is, which in a way is the whole point of Resident Evil. It is a feeling that a lot of newer games just aren't able to replicate. The puzzles in Resident Evil 3 are some of the best in the series. For me they are the most difficult to solve and as a result were the most enjoyable. The puzzles are once again one of the main mechanics for this game and really help add to what makes Resident Evil 3 such a great game. Just as before, solving these puzzles really does feel satisfying. Resident Evil 3 definitely has to be up there with Resident Evil 2 when it comes to puzzles and lately I go back and forth on which one I like more. The puzzles really do make a Resident Evil game for me, and Capcom delivers again. To summarise, the puzzles in this game are one of the main factors that make Resident Evil so great. By this point, Capcom had perfected the horror element of their games, and this is shown throughout Resident Evil 3. As with other games, there are a number of factors to discuss that help add to the overall horror experience. The first are the events or jump scares that Capcom used throughout the game. Perhaps the most famous takes place in the RPD, when Nemesis smashes through the window and begins chasing Jill. When I was younger this scene terrified me. Capcom have built upon both games and I think Resident Evil 3 might have some of the best scares in the series. The camera angles as previously discussed add to the horror, mainly because you cannot tell what is in front of you, instead you can only hear it. For example you will hear a horrific scream in front of you, but you need to continue onwards to see what it is. <laughs> Another example of this are when the Cerebus attack a member of the Umbrella security team. You cannot see it, but you can hear it.
Once again, saving mechanics add to the horror, as you can only save at certain points in the game. I feel like this is amplified more in this game because you could face Nemesis at any point. You are worried that if you do, you could die and have to go back to the previous save. I think the worry you get in this game is worse than in any others due to this. This helps you to keep on edge at all times and makes every interaction with the Nemesis that more terrifying. Another factor is the use of monsters. Zombies are the most common occurrence throughout the game, however this time they are a little quicker. It can be a big shock if you go from playing Resident Evil 2 to 3. I enjoy it though as it makes the zombies much more horrifying, especially when there is a group of them. It is fair to say that there have never been so many in a Resident Evil game. They are everywhere and it makes sense as you are literally walking around the streets of Raccoon City. You really have to pick your moments when it comes to deciding whether to kill them or just avoid them. The Cerberus make a return but honestly, I didn't feel the same frustrating feeling I get from the other games. I love this monster and in previous games they got on my nerves, normally because they are always in tight corridors and avoiding them is a nightmare. However in this game most of the times I met a Cerberus it was in an open section, so the horror of coming across them was not as big. This could be because Capcom chose a new monster to take the reins when it comes to being annoying in tight corridors and that is the Drain Demos. This is a completely new monster to the Resident Evil series. It is basically a flea that has mutated due to the effects of the T-Virus. These monsters are a great addition and are basically the liquor replacement. Their attack can be difficult to avoid, especially when they begin running at you. Capcom for the most part add them to small corridors, making it difficult for the player to get around. At times they are definitely infuriating to me, but for all of the right reasons. The Gravedigger is also a new addition to the game. You encounter it on two separate occasions. I'll be honest, I didn't really enjoy the Gravedigger too much. This was mainly because I didn't feel terrified by it. The first time you meet it, it takes a minute or so to turn the power on and go up the ladder. It hardly offers much of a threat. Then when you fight it in the graveyard, it was by far the easiest boss fight I had in the game. I liked the concept and it was a great creature, but compared to the Nemesis, it just didn't offer me the same horror feeling. Saying that, I know some people do like it and that is fine too. There are also a number of other monsters that make a return, including spiders and hunters. Spiders are a little more frustrating in this game, mainly because after you kill them, baby spiders try to kill you. This is why for the most part, I'll just avoid them. It does make the spiders a little more horrifying though. Hunters are just as annoying as ever, especially if you're attacked by more than one at the same time. If you have the dodging mechanics on point, you can deal with two. However, for some people, fighting multiple hunters is basically a death sentence. I enjoyed seeing both monsters return, especially the hunters however, as they caused me some real issues at times throughout the game. The last two to discuss are the worms and crows. Both offer the same function and that is to be a hindrance. Both are equally as annoying and it is best just to run by them than to actually engage with them. They both help to add to the horror, especially the worms, who can be a real problem if you are not able to avoid them quickly enough. Nemesis is the last monster to talk about in Resident Evil 3, but it is really a horror mechanic in itself. I have never had such difficult boss fights in a Resident Evil game. At times, I was literally shouting at my TV. He is a great addition to the game and he may just be one of the greatest antagonists in video game history. Not only this, but he was a revolutionary idea that Capcom built upon from Resident Evil 2. In Resident Evil 2, you have Mr. X, who shows up at certain points, but for the most part, isn't too hard to deal with. In Resident Evil 3, Capcom have just boosted Nemesis up. He chases you, attacks you, and he is quick. For example, if you run away from him in the police station, he will chase after you the whole time. This is something I had never experienced before when I first played this game. Once again, Capcom led the way in survival horror, adding on to the success of Resident Evil 2. The way Nemesis saves stars is still horrifying to this day. The relentlessness in which he goes after Jill in some ways is impressive. He literally doesn't care about Carlos shooting him because his mission is to kill all stars members. The amount of times he comes back even after being defeated is mind blowing. Even at the end when there is hardly anything left of him, he still tries to get to Jill. It is this relentlessness that is missing from the Resident Evil 3 remake. All of these factors are ideas that have been built upon from the original Resident Evil and Resident Evil 2. Combined they create a truly unique horror experience that Capcom truly was at the forefront of.
there are a number of characters that need to be discussed. Let's start with Jill, who is the protagonist of the game. It is great to jump back into the story of Jill Valentine and pick up after the events of Resident Evil. I feel like Capcom's choice to have Jill makes you connect really well with the story. Seeing Jill fight her way through some old enemies and new ones is truly enjoyable. Jill is the master of pit locking, so no longer do you have to worry about a locked door. Having that feature back is a nice nod to the first game. She is a formidable force when it comes to killing the undead. The fact that she continued to fight Nemesis even when she was infected and weak shows just how strong of a character she really is. Make fans excited to see where her journey will continue from here. The second character to discuss is more of a side character and that is Carlos. When you first meet him, you aren't too sure what to make of him. However, as the game goes on, Carlos proves to us that he does care about other people. Despite Jill's reservations about him, he saves her on multiple occasions and is a great addition to the Resident Evil universe. Nikolai is the third character that needs to be discussed. He is a great character and I truly enjoyed him throughout the game. Although you only see him briefly, every scene he is in is great and you are left wondering what his true intentions are. His death, although unfortunate, is probably deserved. He is a character you can truly hate and is almost like the personification of Umbrella. Capcom takes everything that is great from Resident Evil 2 and builds upon it in order to create a horrifying experience that is amplified due to the inclusion of Nemesis. It is difficult to pick out which one I prefer as both of them have such great qualities. Resident Evil 2 I think will always be my favourite, but Resident Evil 3 is so good too. The atmosphere that is created as you try to make your way through the streets is a feeling that we never get to see again. You really do feel like you are witnessing the virus take over. You see plenty of survivors running away from zombies, only to find them dead later on in the game. You also hear screams and cries for help. I wish Capcom would try and replicate this feeling again. It is clear to see why this game received critical acclaim. The relentless pursuit of Nemesis towards Jill adds a unique element to the game that just wasn't there in Resident Evil 2. You feel as if nowhere is safe and the whole world feels darker. Just as with Resident Evil 2, my hope is that they find a way to make this game more accessible to people, as it is one of the best survival horror games of all time. Once again, Capcom was able to create another hit, with them continuing to revolutionise the genre. So are you ready to try and escape the world of survival horror?